I, I don't have any toddlers, um, but I hear them like, speaking to their books, speaking to their screens, assuming they'll respond back because they have experiences where they talk to devices and it does respond. Welcome everyone to the Voice of Innovation Fireside Chats. We're here to speak with tech innovators and thought leaders to discuss the future of pervasive AI. Today, we're chatting with Dr. Joan Palmater Bajorek. She's the CEO and founder of Women in Voice, a 501c3 nonprofit that addresses the lack of support for women in voice and conversational AI fields, and it has 21 chapters in 15 countries. She's also the number four influencer in the world for voice AI. Joan, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks so much for having me. All right. So Joan, you have this really extensive background in the field of speech language technology, which is what you got your PhD in, and you're a linguist by trade. You've worked deeply in data science and UX design. So tell me a little bit about how all of this technical innovating led to you working on systemic change in the industry. Yeah, great question. Well, I, you know, it's been a winding path. I'll really say that. Um, I was so prepared to go into R&D, right? You know about my technical background, my master's, my PhD, and it's really in my PhD when I looked at how do we make systems better? Like the cutting edge work of today with NLP, with acoustics, where is this headed? Um, and that's where I really learned more about kind of what our data sets look like, who is in the room deciding what this looks like. Um, I have a very famous Harvard Business Review article talking about systemic biases, specifically for race and gender, although that's also socioeconomic status, blah, blah, blah. But when we're looking at systemic change in these systems, when we're looking at innovation, when we're looking at who decides where that innovation goes, it's about who's in the room. And when I realized that it's actually not about necessarily technical limitations, it's about having women and people of color in the room. Um, and when I realized that and was interviewing and, you know, the cacophony of my career, um, that's when I realized some, something had to change. It was kind of complicity or change and <laughs> do something. Um, and I, I launched Women in Voice in 2018. Um, the hunger for it has been uh, way bigger than I expected. You just read off a little bit of where we are, but that's only three years in. So um, we just, um, you know, I, I launched it as a, like a side thing, like women of boys, here's a handle on socials at uh, 27 people signed up for leadership positions in a matter of weeks from all around the world. Um, and we launched chapters from there. It's just been a wild ride, frankly. So i um, really excited about how we can push the technical stuff forward, the really cool cutting edge stuff, as well as making defaulting that women and BIPOC folks are in the room. So I do want to dig a little bit deeper into what your nonprofit is up to now. But before we do that, I, I want to hear more about your background. You have had this really impressive journey that I touched upon briefly, but I, I want you to tell tell me a little bit more about that. Oh, well, thank you. Um, let's see. I am a linguist. I've always loved languages. You know, I was that kid that like was teaching my sister <laughs> fake languages as a kid. Um, you know, my family loves to travel. And when I started looking into linguistics and kind of the science of language, you know, linguists, linguistics can be a, a jargon term that people are like, what does that even mean? But when we really think about the nuts and bolts of what is language, how do computers parse language? I really was starting to see, you know, we throw out NLP, but natural language processing, how are computers processing the way we speak, the way we type, um, how that language evolves, you know, even how we record things. So um, let's see, back to your question. I realized that when acoustics are going to be brought into different uh, technological experiences, it radically changes the user experience and tech will never be the same. Um, I, I make jokes at dinner parties that my work touches hardware that runs software is like one of the ways to define the scope of my research <laughs> um, because, you know, we have IoT wearables, like anything that ha is running software could be running conversational AI today and will be tomorrow and the ecology of our devices. So I, I could tell you about kind of the design things I look at, the data sets I look at, the information systems, the how do we define what good is in performance. 
um, I'm really very T-shaped, <laughs> cross-functional, and people are like, oh, which team do we put you on, the NLP team, the UX team? I don't really care. I care about the impact. I care about how products are being becoming better and so fast. It's in front of our eyes <laughs> um, what's going on in our field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, our world really revolves around automation. And as you said, natural language processing is enabling a lot of that. Search, named entity recognition, document classification, speech to text. But what about all of these kind of emerging loftier goals using these tools for enterprise solutions, healthcare, autonomous vehicles, AR and VR? So where are we kind of at in the development cycle there? Oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> I'd say every company and vertical is different. Um, yeah, I'd have to jump into just one of those to, or that is to say the potential for any of these is huge. Mm-hmm. I really believe in the right use case. I, I don't think like just voiceify anything is actually beneficial. You know, if it's for healthcare, what are we building? How does this augment what we currently have? You know, how can we make medicine better if that's the question on the table? Mm -hmm. You know, if it's for AR, VR, I've done actually a lot of research into kind of multimodal, what does mixed reality, you know, meta is big these days and and thinking about the future of the metaverse, but really um, when we add voice or conversational AI, how do we do that strategically? What do people want to use it for? Does it perform well? Are we just <laughs> saying words in these virtual environments that are goldigock? It really has to fit the use case. Um, and people ex- have extremely high expectations of how the systems are going to perform on day one. And that user expectation also can limit us, but also how prepared we need to be in the labs for what's deployed. Right. I mean, I feel like the the maturation of this tech is really going to enable businesses to to operate like highly skilled data analysts. But I, I want to talk a little bit about equity equity now. So racial and gender bias in AI is still a pretty big problem. It's well known. And specifically with speech recognition technologies, there's difficulty recognizing female voices, those with accents, all of our strange jargon and abbreviations, low resource languages. And, you know, for example, there's over 3000 languages in Africa, but there's very little data on them. And there has been some encouraging new research in the space to better identify language similarities with multilingual transformers and sentence embeddings. So how do we make these models more equitable? Oh my gosh, that is a multi-billion dollar question. (laughs) Um, if If we start from today, I think, and that's a lot of my research is kind of benchmarking where we're at. There's a ton of research, right? Like NVIDIA recently published something like, we got 0.2% better hot damn, (laughs) Uh, you know, how how wonderful, which is significant. But right now we're benchmarking what we're looking at for white, male, native English speakers from California, right? Our data sets are literally sometimes 70% that data. And when we look at not only that, but the hardware, the data, like literally across the whole system, we're defining for really one demographic. And when we look at what we could be building for, frankly, advantageously for like, (laughs) often in my work, my my PhD advisor always says like, there's two parts of my research. It's like system performance, but also why would we even make any changes and kind of the business use case. A lot of people get me in the room just to talk money stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. just some basic algebra ROI. There's literally a job I had that paid me very well of, you know, like if, if my bot could, you know, change your performance 10%, how many Teslas a month are we saving you in business use cases? So I think this guy, the two prong approach is important here. But I, I talk to um, some of my friends in speech sciences who are the top of the world in their field for acoustic modeling stuff, and we talk about you know if I'm design if my preferred demographic to work for is going to be a Gen Z Latina, which statistically would be really smart here in the United States of you know, <laughs> where, where's the money going? You know, if I want to do something that performs well for her voice, how does the hardware have to change? How does my data set need to change? How does the performance of, you know, whatever my hyperparameters look like in a multilingual context, perhaps, you know, all these different pieces of the puzzle need to, need to be tweaked. We have to come from a totally different mindset. Um, and so really that's just one example, as you mentioned with different accents, the, the 
the proliferation of the different variables is, is pretty high. Um, and do we even have data to support if I'm looking for a multilingual Gen Z Latina data set of, of speech samples, does that exist? Right. Um, you know, in an airport, anyway, I, I work with clients to, to really define what the goals are in this case. But I think when we talk about um, today, early adopter data sets, what that looks like, it's really white, it's really male, it's really dominant to California. So I think we have to recognize that framework, but also the huge potential in knowing how to change the systems and optimize them. Um, is um, <laughs> Companies are doing it internally. Some publish research external facing, which I think is really hard when we're trying to figure out what companies are doing what. Um, but I think I'm, I'm really impressed by the Mozilla Common Voice team that is really looking at what percent of gender do we have in different buckets for different languages? Let's be really, really clear about those percentages. Um, and I think that's a great place to start is uh, <laughs> uh, transparency. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with this website, Wink, but they have these open source packages for statistical analysis, NLP, ML, and their developers actually had a use case where they use NLP to help Indian farmers discover crop trends. And they were able to extract extract hyperlocal disease and virus trends, and then create these day-by-day -day timelines to, to help their whole ecosystem and improve their pipelines. Very cool. No, I don't know about this one, but I, I have heard about um, similar but different about um, buying and selling cattle in India is highly fragmented. Have you heard about this one? Yes. They've raised yes. a wild amount of money. Um, I don't know that they're leveraging NLP, but there's these markets that are fragmented higher fidelity data can have really high outcomes. I think what's also what you're saying, um, you know, how we leverage NLP, happy to give more examples, um, but some people are scared about the higher fidelity of data to really see what's going on on the ground floor of whatever the product is. So I think just knowing that what we're stepping into, or I've had to do some weird calculations of like how many people could we fire by building this bot is like a calculation because like headcount is expensive. Like that is the, the operating cost we're, we're looking at. And people are like, wait a minute, you would fire Lisa? I'm like, please don't fire Lisa. Like, you know, maybe the numbers look different. Um, so I think the implications of our work are really important, but I think that's a, I'll have to look into that one. Um, I am really excited and I'd have to like make sure to conflict of interest on um, which ones I help because I do a lot of side projects. Um, I'm really excited about the company Wobot, Wobot Health. Um, they just raised their Series B. They do clinically validated um, conversational bots for mental health. Um, their first rollout was kind of general anxiety, depression type work. Um, they're building out some other things that are, all are public facing. I'll let people check out their website, W-O-E-B-O-T, Wobot. But really thinking about how can we leverage technology for mental health, conversational AI for mental health, clinically validated especially when there like literally aren't enough therapists right now for what's going on and, and <laughs> to support folks. So I think uh, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's mental health and kind of medicine, we can really radically transform what this looks like to literally have it in the hands of almost anyone around the world. Um, the, the power, I think you mentioned my tentacles, but I think the unchecked power is frightening at some points. Um, and I think just really... Um, uh, yeah, I think I mentioned that keeps me up at night. I I still think there's so potential, so much potential. I, I'm I'm not I'm not too terrified today. Anyway, I think Wobot is a fantastic opportunity. Um, I think I mentioned the Mozilla team, but really thinking about how would we support different languages. I have literally men from Nigeria who are are now acquaintances who are like, we see potential here. There is yet very little investment here. How do we evangelize? We need to support our languages. You mentioned like literally how many languages, but how many millions of people speak those languages? Like, or even is speaking, is ASR what we need to be building? That's something I talk with people about. Like, okay, what, what would work for this population? You know, is it, what are the literacy levels? There are reasons why WhatsApp is so popular around the world, right? Like, what do we need to be building? How does it fit the use case? Assume you don't know. I think leading with curiosity, Brené Brown always talks about this, but like, <laughs> don't build the same exact template and assume to just drop it around the world. That's just like post-colonial BS. You know, like, and we really need to think up from the ground up. What works for these people? What do they want to build? 
who's building it. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited and frankly hearing different kind of questions, you know, from different people. Um, and, you know, not yet, not yet. Sometimes the answer is not yet, but I think that hunger for things around the world, literally, I talk to people from Croatia, Nigeria, like um, people are really, really excited about this field. Um, I don't see why people wouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, speech is a part of our everyday lives and it is such a, a powerful subset of artificial intelligence. It's, it's everywhere. Absolutely. And I think um, you, we also mentioned autonomous vehicles. I don't know if you saw the Effectiva acquisition recently um, by SmartEye. There's a, I think it's German, I'll have to look this up, automotive company that just hired or just uh, acquired a behavioral analytics company. So literally you're talking about speech sounds in an automotive environment. Do we have analytics that demonstrate this person shouldn't be driving? I mean, it's just, I literally, I, it's so interesting. I'm, I'm a technical advisor for a real estate SEO company. It could be any vertical. It could be almost any use case. Anyway, we can blow it up real big, but I think these specific examples are also really helpful in this case. Yeah, I know. And I think everyone's starting to envision a future where, you know, you're going home in your autonomous vehicle and maybe you're telling Siri, hey, can we reroute and stop and get groceries on the way home? And I mean, I, I, that future feels a little bit far off, but we, I think we do need to think about how we design our machines to process and analyze massive amounts of natural language data, as you said, kind of from the ground up. We need, we need to design these machines with that in mind. Absolutely. And what you just are talking about is something that is possible today, but you're asking for a multi-slot correctly organized with the correct addresses, very hard problem, and, you know, and then where would it be even geotagged to? Which, you know, grocery store would you be dropped off to? To which location? What three words is working on geolocation tagging? Like it's a multifaceted problem. <laughs> in theory, and that's why we're still clicking buttons, you know, and what's the um, ROI for the business to even be building that for you um, is, uh, I mean, I drop, drop my groceries off. I'm not interested. Um, but I, I hear you. These, the design is actually sometimes some of the hardest pieces of this puzzle, um, which my friend Rebecca Evanho evangelizes a bunch, but it's that quality UX design, you know, buoy, whatever we want to call it, the careful UX iterated design is the one that's going to win at the end of the day if there's you know money behind it. Right, right. And now that we've also kind of, you know, touched on autonomous vehicles and some of these loftier goals, I just also want to quickly talk about AR and VR and deep medicine. So, you know, yeah. there's a lot of interest in making these fluid conversational interva interfaces in the AR and VR space. And I know you have a lot of experience there. And there are really great applications for using augmented reality, training oh, yeah. lawyers, training physicians with simulations, gaming, and so on. And a, a lot of this is just in English, but I, ju I just want to hear a little bit about your experience in the AR and VR space because it is really hot right now. It's really hot. Yeah. Well, actually, my PhD research um, was an ed tech tool. Um, I, I banged down the door of a startup and was like, hey, you know, I'll do free research. You get, donate uh, software. Uh, great, great exchanges. Um, but really looking at that one was, it's called Immerse Me. It's a, a startup based out of New Zealand where we have this AR and in the future VR experience where people are speaking into an immersive experience in a language setting that they're learning the language of. So for example, if you're learning Spanish, you could go to a bar and speak Spanish and have this interaction with someone and the ASR will pick it up. And if you get it right, you'll like choose different things to order at the, the Spanish bar in Spanish. So this type of kind of in situ, um, what's the word? When people forget it's not real. Uh, goodness, my PhD research seems so far away. Anyway, the fact that you think people experience moments of, I thought I was there. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm currently in New Zealand as a middle schooler, but I thought I was in Spain, <laughs> you know, practicing speak, you know, buying pastel or whatever it is. So I think these, these moments of, we create these experiences, people are in this, this, this task is speaking the language, getting like practice speaking with the ASR, picking it up, um, and really the vocabulary practice. So for that kind of task-based ed tech, which 
maybe it's not as sexy as some other, other verticals we're talking about, but the money in ed tech and the power and how we're in that context, having people experience different cultures, different languages without even having to travel during COVID, <laughs> even better because it's all mute. Um, but I think that is one example of a really cool, beautiful, innovative experience that's happening in the ed tech space. They're one of many players um, doing that. Um, you know, the metaverse is, is blowing up. I don't know if you have a specific use case or kind of companies you're watching in that space. With the metaverse specifically? Or, or an AR, VR? Yeah. So actually there, there's a great researcher um, from MIT, Fox Harrell, and he has done a lot of really, really important work in the computational gaming space. And he has been leveraging these tools to train younger students about racial bias. And I don't know if you're familiar with his work at all, but he's he's definitely uh, worth checking out. He actually recently won an Emmy uh, for his work on deep fakes. He uh, he created a deep fake um, for the Apollo Eleven mission that was the contingency speech if the mission did not go as planned. Mm. Um, so yeah, his his work is really really interesting. So that's kind of I, I definitely look to him to see uh, what you know use cases are not just going to be more of the flashy gaming side that is really fun and entertainment, but he, he is doing this fusion of gaming and education that I think will make students excited about learning about really tough topics that uh, historically we haven't touched upon because maybe we just haven't had the right tools. Or maybe the person wasn't building it. I mean, but yeah, yes, right, um, right. All, all of the above. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't yet know about that work, but it sounds so phenomenal. One final area I just want to touch upon before I ask you a little bit about your future predictions in the space is applying natural language processing to healthcare and deep medicine. You know, we've seen semi-automating medical coding and extracting information from radiology reports so that physicians can, you know, quickly get information about what this might look like, compare it to a ton of other reports, and then give really personalized care. There's also another researcher, Regina Barzilay, who's working on a lot of predictive models for breast cancer and personalizing care using an AI-based risk model. So what are you most excited about in, in the deep medicine space using NLP? Yeah, um, well, many things. And I think you just mentioned some really cool examples. And I think what is, I've read some of these research papers saying, you know, we you know, leverage neural nets or again, it's with these fragmented places. When we think about all these researchers around the world working on similar problems, who are building data sets that are not necessarily open source for many, many good reasons and a lot of money reasons, you know, different institutes and so forth. They're publishing papers, let's say five to 10. Do those papers speak to each other? Usually those papers are maybe even two years in production. And by the time they're even published, the, the, the institutes are working on different things. The PIs are working on different things. So when we have the data sets or even just the papers, as you're mentioning, and we can see patterns within the top research in the world about breast cancer, about whatever it is. I mean, we've seen wild amounts of inferences. Wait a minute. <laughs> you know, of these papers, seven of them implicate that this protein is a huge piece of the puzzle you know, who is investigating that protein or can we go to, you know, the billionaires of the world and get more money to work specifically on this problem. And I think it's been frankly shocking to the medical field. I've heard to, <laughs> are these robots doing it? Or, you know, is this NLP scraping and finding things that we didn't see? I think there's a little bit of kind of, I don't know if it's shame or hubris loss, or maybe the person who finds it is more excited, but I really think it can augment our work. I don't believe that we're going to be uh, replacing these PIs in the lab uh, probably anytime soon, but supported by robots, supported by conversational AI, looking through different things, scraping the data sets. We need these, this innovation in medicine faster than we can build it, right? Um, so I think it's really exciting. It's a little bit scary. Um, I, I, I work, uh, I do some consulting for a medical hardware company um, that works on critical care and just kind of thinking about, I work in software most of the time, you know, we find some bugs, we got a two week sprint, we fix as much as we can, you know, half a million dollars usually. Anyway, when it comes to medical hardware, the product life cycles can be seven to 10 years. 
like I, I, it blew my mind that that's just in the medical hardware space. It's not necessarily for this company, but when I realized the bets one has to make so early, it really blew my mind of what kind of products we might want to see on the market. And like, if I were in a critical care situation, I want, you know, physicians to have these tools. It frankly is a little shocking to me that some of them don't exist. FDA, there, there's a multitude of reasons why not. But I think especially when you're talking about the deep tech, when you're thinking about medicine as our vertical, people who are literally dying from these diseases right now, who are would beg to be part of these clinical trials, right? That, that can sometimes be years in duration. I don't know if you, your personal experience, my, my aunt unfortunately recently uh, passed based on a brain tumor. Um, but we would love, you know, what might exist in three years that could have saved her. I, I, she had a beautiful, fabulous life, but I'm just saying we can't move fast enough in, in my opinion. And so why wouldn't we be leveraging conversational AI, state of the art things to be finding it's, it's pattern matching, right? We're yeah. looking at these different things and making better informed decisions about the next steps as a data driven researcher. This is like my bread and butter. Like, duh, why wouldn't you look at the data? The, the top five, three to five things are these. Let's go hit those. Let's go make sure we take care of that immediately. So I think that applies to almost any field, but especially what you're talking about with these, again, fragmented data sets. And, and sometimes collaboration even isn't advantageous to faculty members who are vying for NIH grants. It's, we, we could do a lot to innovate in that space. Right, right. We definitely can, and, and we need to. So future forward thinking. You know, 25 years ago, Richard Lippman, another MIT guy, he wrote a paper, which I'm sure you're familiar um, with, on speech recognition by machines and humans. And he noted that these talker independent recognizers had error rates that were less than 10% when these sentences were recorded in quiet environments. So what does the next 25 years look like? Oh, goodness. What does the next 25 years look like? The way we've even done automatic speech recognition, what ASR looks like today, has pivoted so many times. (laughs) You know, speaking each word separately, training the models where you have to speak for three hours to try to, you know, get your voice, sound boxes that block out any other sound, because we're always going to live in these boxes, right? Like, that's obviously... Um, you know, neural nets, concatenation, what we're seeing now with these hyperparameters, like how much has evolved? Asking about 25 years is like a real big question. Uh, I think in the next five years, we're going to see huge amounts of system performance improvements. I, I know externally facing teams that are working so hard on these problems, um, brilliant people all around the world. So the how much this will progress, and as you mentioned, different contexts, Data sets of people speaking in airports is literally a business model that some companies have to sell those data sets. Like you have to, <laughs> you have to realize the marketplaces for these things. Um, where are we going to? These are going to get a lot better. I don't ever getting them to, as I mentioned, all voices, all sounds, and us be able to parse them perfectly in real time with zero latency is a very, very hard problem. Um, I hope to live long enough that we find that solution, but it'll be a multi-pronged solution that we probably have not seen yet today. So I guess I'm really excited about ASR and and TTS and the the NLP, but I think what I'm even more jazzed about is how it's going to transform our world and our use cases for day-to-day things that we barely even pay attention to today, that the next few generations like the, um, I have a friend who like his son didn't, doesn't believe him that he is older than Google <laughs> because the concept of Google not existing is out of scope of, of how to think. And I, I, I don't have any toddlers, um, but I hear them like, speaking to their books, speaking to their screens, assuming they'll respond back because they have experiences where they talk to devices and it does respond and if that's the framework we're thinking about, of, duh, <laughs> why doesn't it already? These ecology of, a vice, of devices, ambient computing will be the default. And so what are we going to choose to build? Who is going to build it? Um, it's like really, really, really exciting. And I, I see these entrepreneurs rising who are working on different parts of these problems. 
So it's really, do people care enough who's staffed on that <laughs> and where do they get the money to build it is like um, more where my heart is currently nested. That's great. Well, Joan, thank you so much. This was an absolutely amazing conversation. I am super excited to follow your work and everything that you are accomplishing and, and doing for the field of conversational AI and voice. It's really exciting. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you. 